It's Shabam, sponsored in part by Google. Everything we human beings do has a beginning in our brain. Enormously complex structure. Last episode, we talked a lot about the brain. The most complicated biological structure in the... Sure, it's awesome, but sometimes it gets in the way of us figuring out what's really happening. You must not fool yourself. Which is why we also talked about how scientific thinking keeps our brains focused on the truth by avoiding... Brain traps! But what we didn't talk about is another problem with your brain. To think everything you are is contained in this small, mushy lump of fatty tissue. And this is a problem because that lump of soft fatty tissue is very delicate and needs to be taken care of. Which is why it's floating in fluid and encased in a protective thing called the skull. But there are physically things that can happen to your brain Josh. so that it makes it so that your brain Are you okay? I actually have a huge headache and and there seems to be what looks like a small brachiosaurus in the studio with us being fed popcorn by Beyonce. What are you doing? You know I don't talk about that. Is anybody else seeing this? Josh, you look horrible. Josh has a fever. Oh, sit down. I'm He's experiencing down. something we call a febrile hallucination Ow. or delirium. She's wasting all Josh. the popcorn. You see, Josh has a virus, which has caused his body temperature to spike. And he also should not have come in to work today. I told him not to come in. No, I'm fine. You're not fine. You look You're terrible. Just, I'm going to take a little nap on the floor. The fatty tissues of the brain are so delicate that they can malfunction oh. simply because of raised body temperature. Viruses aren't the only things that give us fevers. Bacteria, parasites, and fungus. They can all make us sick. They can all give us a fever. Okay, some water. okay Josh, go home, get some sleep, right. and let your body do its thing. What about the podcast? Please just go home. Do not come near me. Go home. Okay, fine. I'm gonna, don't record anything without me. To understand what all these things are doing and what a fever is, let's first explore what happens when we get sick. Hello? Remember our dad, Cyril, from the last episode? Dad! Why are you talking to me and I'm on the phone talking to somebody else? I'm trying to help We are going to take a trip inside his body to find out what happens yes, I, I tried, when we have a foreign invader. Already. Hello? Hello? Oh. Hey, Mel, where are we? All right, we're starting out in a lymph node. What's a lymph node? And I feel a lot better, by the way. Thanks. Lymph nodes are like these little collections of tissues that kind of look like little beads or marbles that are all over your body. I like to think of the lymph nodes as little jails for the bad stuff that shouldn't be in your body. That's my good friend and colleague, Dr. Spangler. And that's why they get swollen when you're sick, because they collect all the bad germs. But we'll explain more about that in just a little while. Which lymph node are we in, by the way? We're actually in the left occipital jugulodigastric node. Really? You know, the one right uh, sort of below your ear, just behind your jaw. Great, so we'll just hang out here in Cyril's jugulo whatever lymph node, and then you can continue with your explanation. Usually when you get sick, it's because some foreign organism that shouldn't be in your body gets in. Like in Cyril's case, where he cut himself on that rusty latch Ouch! that's absolutely covered in bacteria. Or when somebody sneezes in the elevator without covering their mouth, sharing the whole place with viruses. Come on. Oh, sorry. And he breathes it in. Come on, Scott. Or he eats some contaminated food <laughs> from that cute little deli around the corner. Scott really needs to work from home. <laughs> totally. <laughs> that the health inspector gave a D rating to. Is this pastrami? Any organism in your body that's not supposed to be there, we call a pathogen. Pathogen. And you never know when a pathogen will show up unexpectedly. Hi, Mr. Walker. Hi, Nadine. Is Elliot home? Elliot! Nadine's here! When these pathogens show up unexpectedly and get into your body, they make you sick. Um, Mr. Walker, why are you dancing? Excuse me! Hey, Nadine. I got the new Cockroach Commando app. Wanna play? Cool! Hey, is your dad all right? <sighs> Are any of us truly all right? Common symptoms include a fever, nausea, and of course, diarrhea. Mom! Hey, Owen. Do we have any more air freshener? In Cyril's case, most of his problems were caused by bacteria, which isn't that surprising since bacteria cover the entire planet, even you. Which brings us to this song. <laughs> oh, I got this feeling that I'm coming in church. Two, three, we're everywhere, we're in your hair. We're even in your underwear. Microorganisms make your skin all bumpy uh, Anthrax and cholera uh, TB, listeria uh, Staph and salmonella And we cause cavities Oh, I don't feel so good Okay, so bacteria are everywhere 
And that's perfectly normal because not all bacteria are pathogens. Some are supposed to be on you and in you. The problem is the ones that are not supposed to be in there. But what's happening when these little guys get inside of you? When bacteria get into your body, they start eating. Usually they're eating your cells. And they excrete or release chemicals which are toxic to us. They eat, excrete, multiply, eat some more, produce some more toxin. And this is really bad for us. For example, botulism is caused by a toxin released by the botulinum bacterium. How you doing? And that toxin paralyzes your muscle cells and then it kills you. Most pathogens are doing some version of the same thing. Parasites, fungus, and bacteria are all just organisms that eat, excrete, and reproduce. We're basically just a food source for them. Hey, we're just trying to survive. We just get a little bite to eat wherever we can. And multiply. Oh, hey, I don't. And then there are viruses. Viruses are a little different. They don't need food because they don't multiply like other organisms. What they do is actually ingenious. You have been infected and now you will make more of us. They hijack your cells and get them to do the work. You see, every cell in your body has a copy of a long stringy molecule called DNA. And DNA is often called the code of life. DNA. DNA is a molecular code which your cells can read. Wait a minute, that sounds like the barcode scanner at the supermarket. Yeah, you know it's exactly like that, except way more complex. And this code tells a cell what kind of a cell it is. I'm a heart cell, part of the heart. I'm a lung cell, I'm part of the lung. I'm the kidney cell, I just... And what it should be doing. Reabsorbing some nutrients, making pee, pumping it up, pumping the blood, part of the heart. hoo ha yep. When a virus attacks, I'm a lung cell. Well, oh, hey there, little guy. What are you doing? It slips an extra set of instructions into that cell's DNA. And I, oh, wait, new instructions. Telling that cell, hey, stop what you're doing and make more of us. Let's, uh, okay, let's just make this thing. And that's exactly what the cell does. Okay. So now the cell is just making viruses. Now I don't really know why I'm doing this. And filling up. Uh, what's going on here? Until it finally explodes with all those viruses, sending them all around the body to infect other cells. And the process starts again, replicating viruses, cell filling up, exploding, spreading more virus. You may be asking, if these pathogens destroy our cells, why are we still alive? Why hasn't Cyril turned into a big squishy pile of bacteria and viruses? Oh. Honey, are you going to be okay? Oh. We're going to take a little break. Honey, you're scaring the kid. Oh. When we come back, we'll find out why Cyril is going to be just fine and what's preventing our mushy brains from getting eaten. Hey, this is Dr. Jess Mason with a quick aside. Earlier, they mentioned the bacteria that causes botulism, called Clostridium botulinum. How you doing? And how it produces a toxin that can kill you by paralyzing your muscle cells. Well, this is actually the same toxin that people get injected into their faces, and that's called Botox. In really small micro amounts injected into targeted muscle cells, it doesn't kill you. It just paralyzes those muscles for about six months, which makes the wrinkles relax. For patients who get Botox, like Gina's friend Gail, it makes the wrinkles temporarily go away. Botox is like a miracle. I look at least 20 years younger. Are you smiling right now? Uh-huh. So pathogens destroy our cells. Bacteria do this by producing toxins, and viruses use your cells as duplication factories. So the question still remains, what's stopping all our cells from getting destroyed and us turning into a big mushy pile of bacteria and viruses? Well, we would turn into a mushy sack of bacteria and viruses if it wasn't for... Wait for it. ...our immune system. Welcome to the immune system. So the immune system is kind of like the security system of our body. That's Dr. Spangler again. And it's really responsible for protecting us from all the pathogens wherever and whenever they show up in your body. Stay alert, everybody. And here's how it works. It basically has three levels of defenses. You are now at level one. So the environment that we live in is really full of things that shouldn't be inside of us. And so there needs to be a separation from the outside, dirty world that we live in. And that's why your insides are wrapped in this tough organic layer. 
Like a skin bag? Exactly. And most of those pathogens that live in the environment are kept out by the skin. And that's why when something pierces the skin, Ow! infection is such a big concern. Or if large parts of your skin get damaged, like when you get burned because that outer barrier is now violated open. So level one is the awesome protective shield called the skin. Level two. So the next layer of defense is level two. It's called the innate immune system, and it's like having a bunch of cellular cops that are on patrol. And these cells are constantly roaming around the body, taking out intruders. Excuse me, who are you? Oh, me, I'm just a harmless single bacterium. Whoops. Get out of here. Harmless. Somebody eat these guys. <laughs> so remember that rusty metal that cut Cyril's arm? Yes, I do. It had bad bacteria on it that pierced the skin. Oh. And as soon as that happens, the level two cells go straight to the arm to get rid of the bacteria that's there. We the skin. Oh, what are you doing? Uh, nothing. We're hey, harmless. take them out, boys. Our bodies are constantly being invaded by bacteria and viruses, but we don't notice because level two is doing its job. Anyway, that's level two. Always on, but invisible. You are now at level three. Then there's level three, and they're like the SWAT team of the immune system. We don't come out for just nothing. It's called the adaptive immune system. And level three really only gets activated when there's a really big problem, like breathing in a disgusting virus. <laughs> ah, come on, Scott. Let's go, boys. We got a job to do. Or eating a big chunk of bacteria from a sandwich. So when these pathogens come in and they overwhelm level two, There's too many of them. that's when level three kicks in. Don't worry, boys, we got your back. And these are the highly specialized groups of cells, much like the SWAT team, that take out specific threats. Tagging team. One group of level three cells is on the tagging team, and they identify the bad guys and tag them. Yep, that's the bad guy, that's the bad guy, you're a good guy. Bad guy, bad, bad, good, bad, oh, ugly. Disposal team. Another group of cells on the disposal team can now go around and know who to eat. He's tag, get him. He's tag, get him. Good, get those guys. All this takes time, and while the body is figuring out who to target, the pathogen is multiplying. So to help this adaptive immune system, your body will actually raise its temperature. That's a fever. It does this because pathogens have a hard time multiplying when the temperature is higher. Is anybody else hot? So once your body fights off a particular disease, another set of cells memory team. on the memory team keep a record of that pathogen. Okay, that one was a doozy. Let's remember that one. Hmm? So the next time it comes into your body, there's no wasted time, <laughs> and the threat gets eliminated before you have a chance to get sick. Okay, so our immune system does a great job of fighting off infection, and that protects us and our brains. We're going to take a little break, and when we come back, we're going to look at how we can help our bodies avoid the fight in the first place. Uh, another day, another pathogen. Yep, we did it. You know, I feel like the whole level three department would work a lot more efficiently if we already knew who the bad guy Yeah, that's what we do. We're on a memory team. We remember that, yeah. No, no, we're always one attack behind. Oh. We get attacked, and then we remember. I guess so. If we could get a list of the bad guys beforehand, we wouldn't have to wait until we got attacked oh. to know who's bad and who's good. I don't think that list exists. Yeah, I know it doesn't exist. I say it would be great if it did no, exist. what we need is like a dummy bad guy that we can practice on so the first attack air quotes, it's more like a scrimmage. Then we'd remember how to fight them when the real bad guys show up. That's dumb. Who's going to do that? Oh, that's dumb? No, it is. Talking dumb. about getting it is dumb. So before the break, we were talking about how good our body is at fighting off diseases. Problem is, the process of fighting off a pathogen isn't always without consequences for your body. The polio virus, for example, can leave you paralyzed because the virus targets nerve cells. And measles, which many people think is like getting over the chicken pox, is actually way worse. Measles virus was also, prior to vaccine introduction, the most common cause of acquired blindness. That's Bill Moss. Yes, my name is William Moss. I am a professor of epidemiology at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And he's done a lot of work studying measles. Measles increases the risk of children getting and dying from pneumonia and diarrhea for weeks to months, perhaps even years following measles. Measles basically beats the shizzle out of your immune system, which leaves you more vulnerable to other diseases. Polio leaves you paralyzed 
Which is why, when Cyril was a baby, he got a whole bunch of vaccination shots. With dummy polio and dummy measles. And we call them dummy viruses because they look like the real thing to your body, but they don't actually cause polio or measles. Once they enter his system, Bad guy. they get stored by the memory team. Okay, uh, polio. How do you spell polio? P polio. Oh, yeah. Thanks. And if the real polio or measles virus shows up, well, his level three cells, they're ready. You have been- they're prepared. We've been waiting for you. And he doesn't get sick. So your immune system is what keeps you from being overrun by bacteria and viruses and other pathogens. This is also why the HIV virus is so deadly. It attacks cells too, but it specifically targets the cells of the immune system. That's right. It's attacking the very system that's supposed to protect you. Now with weakened defenses, it's a lot easier to get attacked by other pathogens. Cyril actually has a very healthy immune system, so the food poisoning only lasted a day, and the cold he got from inhaling Scott's sneeze only gave him a runny nose and a lingering cough. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Wait, what did I do? It's what you didn't do. Next time, cover your mouth or work from home. Even have that much Bye, Felicia. Food. What? So we know pathogens get us sick, and we know that our immune systems are what keep us healthy. And staying healthy keeps our brains healthy. And we're gonna take a little break, and when we come back, we'll find out if there are pathogens that can do more than just get us sick. <coughs> and now a short word from our sponsor, Luigi and Dino's pasta that looks like bacteria, and they can explain it to you better than I can. Let me show you, let me show you. We make a pasta that look like a bacteria, okay? We got a little balls called a cocke. Cocke! We got a little rods called a bacilli. A bacilli. Spirillum is a little spirally. And a little string of corkscrews called a spirochetti. A spirochetti. Vibrio is a little, little squishy comma. Vibrio is like a squishy comma. It's a great addition to any meal. You eating a bacteria anyway, why not eat a pasta that look yeah, like Luigi, a Yeah, Luigi, they get the point, they get the point, okay? So buy, buy the pasta that look like a bacteria because you eat a bacteria anyway, okay? Okay, in the last section we talked about how pathogens get us sick. But, are there pathogens that can do more than make us sick? Well, maybe the best way of exploring this question is by engineering our own infectious disease. But let's make it fun, shall we? Yup, but let's do it. Let's make it fun. There is a ton of zombie movies out there. So many, in fact, that if you don't know what a zombie is, please email us immediately and explain how this is possible. For the person who's never heard of zombies and yet listens to podcasts, this explanation is for you. A zombie. A stereotypical zombie is a dead person who now mindlessly walks around seeking to eat human flesh. Are these people alive or dead? We don't know. Now this is usually caused by some pathogen that gets spread through biting. Well, you are bitten! And after you turn into a zombie, you sound like this. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take our little fictional podcast family and drop them into the middle of a zombie apocalypse that we're about to engineer. Wait, what? what? And then we're going to sit back we're a family. and see what happens. Doctors are supposed to help people. But what kind of pathogen should it be? Infect it with what? Josh, Wendy, Greg Moran? I am Greg Moran. I am an emergency physician. I am the chief of the emergency department at all of you UCLA Medical Center. And I'm also trained in infectious diseases. So that's my particular interest is infections. Let's jump right in. We've already established some zombie characteristics like they used to be human and now they attack humans, usually by biting them. Oh, jolly! Which means, first off, we're looking for a pathogen that changes human behavior. And that means it has to affect the brain. One of the really coolest ones is the zombie ant fungus. Scientific name, Orpheocordyceps unilateralis. This fungus infects the brains of carpenter ants. Now, usually these ants climb around eating leaves, but when this fungus gets into their brains... It actually changes the behavior of the ants. So when the ants become infected with this fungus, it actually causes them to climb up a plant, makes the ant take their mandibles, their big pinchers on their jaws, and they latch onto the underside of a leaf where it's just the right conditions for this particular fungus to live. And then the fungus slowly kills the ant. Basically, this fungus turns the ant into the perfect delivery vehicle. Once the ants die, the fungus grows out of its head and produces a bud that releases millions of spores into the air that fall down to the forest floor to infect more ants. Okay. So a brain-altering fungus is one option. But the problem is even fast-growing fungi are fairly slow, and this one takes a few days to infect the tiny ant brain. We want a zombie pathogen that infects people's brains and fast. So I'd say fungus is out. Fungus. 
All right, so what about this? There's a parasite called toxoplasmosis. That's the thing that you get from cat poo. So if you are in a position to be changing cat boxes, you're very likely infected. We've got a bunch of cats at my house. I'm probably infected. <laughs> and uh, if you have cats at home, there's a pretty good chance that you're infected. Which means Wendy's infected. Great. About half of the people on the planet are infected with this parasite, but most of us who are infected don't get sick. If you have a healthy immune system, you are very unlikely to get sick from this. This parasite goes for the brain as well, and it changes the behavior of mice and rats. It appears to change their aversion to cat odors. Typically, if you're a rat or a mouse, and you're in an area and you smell cats around there, if they smell those odors, they get out of there. But these particular infected animals, they lose that aversion. So they're more likely to get eaten by cats. Then the cat gets infected, the cat poops, I clean it up, then I get infected. Wendy's infected. Wonderful. So a brain hijacking protozoan is another option. But again, what's the incubation period? An incubation period is the time between when the pathogen infects you and when you get sick. So for us, it means if I were to get bit by a zombie, how long would it take for me to become a zombie too? It's kind of hard to know what the incubation period is for toxoplasmosis because typically people who get symptomatic from it were probably infected years before and they're just carrying it in their body. And what happens is their immune system goes down and that's when they develop the symptoms from it. But this one also would not be one that typically we would expect would have a very fast incubation period. It wouldn't be on the order of minutes or hours if you're talking zombie apocalypse. Parasite. Okay, fungus and parasites are out. Too slow. Actually, this means anything with a reproductive cycle is also out. Because it takes too long for it to eat, multiply, and grow. So that includes bacteria. So we're left with viruses. What about a rabies-type virus? It can alter behavior, make people agitated. It makes animals more aggressive, and it's spread through saliva, so we get the biting thing as well. The problem with rabies for a zombie scenario is it takes too long. Great. It takes weeks, usually, because what happens is the virus reproduces in the skin, then it makes a jump into the nerve cell, that gap in time is what gives us the opportunity to prevent it by giving rabies shots. Once it makes the jump into the nerve cell, then it very slowly goes up the nerve cell into the brain. Once it's spread to enough tissue in the brain, that's when the person starts to get symptoms. Okay, so we need a virus that ends up in your brain, but works fast to get there. Two big things affect how fast a virus infects you. One is how fast it hijacks your cells and replicates, and the second is how much you are exposed to. So let's start with the first one. Hijack speed. We need a fast hijacker. One example of one would be a cold virus. A cold virus can go from infecting you to causing symptoms in less than a day. So even with a really fast hijacker, the incubation period still isn't fast enough. How do we shorten the incubation period even more? How quick can we get this virus to infect people? I mean, some movies have people turning into zombies within minutes or even seconds. That would, no. I don't think that's really feasible. The difficulty is that we still need to adhere to the laws of physics and mathematics. If you just take one virus, and it takes that one virus a while to fill up a cell and explode and infect some more cells, that's way less efficient than if you have a million viruses infect a person at once, because they can spread through the body much faster. This brings us to number two. Amount of exposure. We need this virus to spread in a way that exposes you to a huge amount of viruses right off the bat. And then you could get infected in a realistic two or three hours. Would biting do that? You'd really need a buttload of viruses in that saliva for that to work. But there's also another way. There are other ways that viruses, bacteria can be spread also between individuals. One common way that they're spread is what's called fecal oral which, yes, is just as disgusting as it sounds. The old poop in the mouth. The old poop in the mouth, yes. Microscopic particles of feces in your mouth. You would be surprised at how often we are exposed to microscopic levels of poop in our daily lives. And a lot of infections are actually spread this way. So this virus would cause people to have massive, explosive diarrhea that gets all over the place. And that's not unrealistic. Ebola virus, once people are really sick, it's everywhere. It's huge amounts of virus throughout their body, and it makes them poop. It gives them diarrhea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this virus would be just like that, as well as making you really aggressive. So you'd be attacked by these aggressive zombies covered in virus-filled diarrhea. Yeah. No. Come on! And then we throw in some vomiting in there, and maybe if you're getting... So when you're getting attacked by 
you're exposed to like a huge amount of viruses because these zombies would be dripping with like virus filled vomit and diarrhea and now you could have them all covered in festering pustules uh, you could have them vomiting blood and pooping blood and all that stuff. God, yes. no. no. So No, cool. come on. It would be so cool. Not only are they trying to eat you, but they're just covered in poop. And no, belly. no, so no. Disgusting. no. It's the zombie the, vomit no. poop apocalypse we've yeah. all been hoping for. There'd be like poop everywhere. It'd be like vomit I, on like the streets and on your doorknobs I love and like it. everywhere. Yes, you're you're are... actually selling us on the idea, by the way. New York, Paris, London, Sydney, just covered in stool and zombies and it's just fantastic. Totally. That's what we should do. No. Oh, oh come, come on. on. So after a brief discussion, we've decided that we're not going to go with the poop Vomit zombie filled apocalypse, even though uh, we all know that would be so cool. Yeah, and what we've reluctantly settled on is a zombie virus that replicates like the cold virus, gets into your brain and makes you aggressive, like rabies does to animals, but it has an incubation period of about two to three hours. It also has to be all over you and in all your bodily fluids, just like Ebola. And it's mainly spread by biting, and that's just because when you get aggressive, you bite people. You want to eat them. Much better. What? Much better. We have jobs. That's horrible. You shouldn't be listening What's to this wrong right with now. You people and plans. Yeah, you guys are fictional. Get out of here. Okay, now we need a name. How about uh, Zomboni? The Zomboni virus. How about Zomboni? Really? Like the machines that polish the ice skating rinks? <laughs> horrible. And a better name would be I don't know something realistic like the acute hyper aggression syndrome. Aha. Uh-huh. Yeah. Aha. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay, both of those are horrible. Ugh. Right, I have an idea. Okay. How about we name it after the Roman goddess of the night? And who is she? She's the mother of rabies, who's the goddess of madness. Nice. Okay. She's also the mother of Morse, the god of death. <sighs> okay. And Cupid, oh my god. who's the god of love. That <laughs> what is her name? Her name? her name is Nox. Nox. N-O-X. The Nox virus. Nox virus. That works. I like it. I mean, it's not Zamboni. <laughs> <laughs> I like Zamboni the best. <laughs> okay, so we've named the virus... Let's get this epidemic started. Flight 564 making an emergency landing at LAX. But that's next time on Shabam. We're declaring emergency. We need to land. Shabam is produced by CC Herbert. Can you give me a more specific nature of this medical emergency so I can pass it on to Andrew and Kerr? Your hosts, Mel Herbert, Josh Kerr, and Wendy Roderweiss also created the show. Report of a sick passenger. Our recording engineer mix master is Bill Connor. But before he collapsed, he reportedly bit another passenger. Our voice actors are Sean Paris, Jess Thigpen, Steve Santucci, Chase Zawalinski, Rose Sengenberger, and Dave Mason. Passengers on that flight say the man was having seizures and making sounds of distress. Special thanks to Dr. Mizuho Spengler, Dr. Jess Mason, Dr. William Moss, and Dr. Greg Moran. More than 200 other passengers were allowed to leave the plane after the sick man was taken to a hospital for evaluation. Also featuring the musical stylings of Matt Eccles, Luke Pochask, and Amy Limpignacle. Officials say it was just an isolated medical incident. Shabam is a presentation of Fully Boo Incorporated. We have a developing story. This episode of Shabam is sponsored in part by the making and science team at Google. And why is that? Because Google loves science. <laughs>